How are you doing today? Hi, I'm Ellie. Welcome to Jewish Music Toronto's Live with the Cantors. This week's episode of Live with the Cantors is brought to you by Umami Sushi, Toronto's best kosher maki as rated by Blog TO. Umami Sushi does more than standard sushi. They also offer senken cups, cucumber cups filled with sushi ingredients, sushi pizza, sushi sandwiches, sushi burritos, and their newly added poke bowls. Select from a base of white or brown rice, add your protein, choose your basic toppings, premium toppings, and your favorite sauce, and you've got your own custom poke treat. Click the link in the description to find your new favorite take on sushi, Umami Sushi, experience the fifth element of taste. Today we're coming to you from New York City. I'm at the Fifth Avenue Synagogue and I promise that I will try to share some photos with you of this beautiful building afterward on the JMT Patreon page, uh, possibly about a week after the show. Uh, before I introduce today's guest, I noticed that some of you are watching out there on your mobile phones and specifically smartphones, so I wanted to take a moment and make a quick note to those of you who are tuning in live. If you want to participate in the live chat at any time, all you have to do is turn your phone upright and click the chat bar near the bottom of your phone. That will allow you to actually write in comments. Now, I'm excited to introduce this week's guest. Hailing from New York by way of London, Johannesburg, and his hometown of Tel Aviv, uh, this award-winning cantor holds diplomas from the Music Academy in Tel Aviv and from Great Britain's Royal Academy Trinity College of Music. Uh, he's a fellow of the Trinity College of Music, among many other accolades. He has performed at New York's Madison Square Gardens, Carne uh, Carnegie Hall, and the, London uh, the Lincoln Center's David Geffen and Alice Tully Halls as well as major venues in Amsterdam, London, Brussels, and more. He's the Distinguished Professor of Liturgical Music at Yeshiva University's Bell School of Music and has served at Chazan here at the Fifth Avenue Synagogue for 45 years. Joining me today is Cantor Yosef Malavani. Thank you for joining me today. It's my pleasure, anytime. Uh, and thank you not only for joining me, but hosting me in this beautiful synagogue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when I start the show, I like to begin by asking my guests about their youth. Uh, in your case, you were born in a particular, particularly significant place at a particularly significant time. Uh, you were born in Tel Aviv in 1941. Sure. And that was while it was still under British control as mandatory Palestine. Uh, that would have made you approximately seven years old at the time of Israeli independence, am I correct? Something like that, actually six and something. Yeah. Six and change. Uh, what, if anything, do you recall from your, your and your family's life at that time? Well, I recall uh, when uh, Ben-Gurion uh, declared the state of Israel, my father was not home. My father was in the Haganah and then in the military of Israel and he sneaked in home that night, on that Friday night, just to give a kiss to my mother and to my brother and myself. And then he was off. He was the first one to shoot an Egyptian plane that was bombing Tel Aviv. So that I recall, not very clear, but I do recall something. I recall maybe the end of the British mandate when they were already leaving I didn't understand much about it but something I can see the corner of Allenby Street and Hess and Yonah Navi where I grew up number 42 I recall seeing some people coming and be running to the center of Tel Aviv to dance Eventually, I found out that they were dancing, right. but they were all running, 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 full of excitement. That's something I remember. Do you remember much from before then as well? Not, not, much. not much. No, no. no not uh, much. Hey, young life, it's, it's very, uh, uh, you're growing here. There's a lot going on as course, it is just for yourself. Of course, of uh, course. Um, I do want to know uh, what you also remember from the first Yom Hatzmu itself, aside from just the running of the street? I don't street. remember anything. No. No. Uh. 
Yom Atzmaut, at that time it was not even declared Yom Atzmaut right. in 1948. I think that the first Yom Atzmaut was the year later. I don't, rem don't recall anything whatsoever. Mm. I only remember that my father on the eve of Yom Atzmaut stood up, took me to shul and said Shechianu. The prayer where we thank the Almighty for bringing us to this great day. That I remember. Were you able to feel the, uh, the emotion for him? Very much time? so. He explained to me after that why he did that. He said that he felt the hand of God during the War of Liberation. He experienced miracles as the war was progressing. And uh, years and years later, when I already was, was more aware of what was going on, uh, he, my, I saw my father wearing his best suit, because to him it was a great holiday. And every Yom Atzmaut, Shechianu, Hallel, the prayer of Hallel, with a bracha, and uh, of course I got, then eventually when I became a member of the choir in Tel Aviv at the Bilu, maybe we'll speak about it, um, yes. Uh, in an article about uh, your life and career in Lifestyle magazine, uh, you were described as actually having started engaging, uh, the, the words they used were engaging his maker in a musical dialogue since he was seven years old. Uh, what was the article's author, Eliza Davidovit, uh, uh, describing in that line? Well, what she did was the following what she meant and what she referred to. I joined the choir. Well, look, we had a school mm. and a shul called Bilu on Rothschild Boulevard. That's uh, the Bilu synagogue complex. Yeah, well, it's a, syn a school and a shul, a synagogue complex. Beautiful synagogue. And um, the teacher who taught us and prepared that was himself a retired cantor by the name of Shlomo Ravitz, who was the cantor of, in Riga, in Kharkov, eventually in Johannesburg, in other places, then he made Aliyah to Israel. And when he retired from being the cantor of the great synagogue in Tel Aviv, he was asked by the principal of the school, Shimon, uh, uh, um, Chaim Mishori, Shimon was his son, Chaim Mishori, to come and to teach children to Davo and to form a choir of 40 boys. Eventually, that choir was called the Vienna Boys Choir of Tel Aviv. Vienna, Vienna those who know classical music mm. know that the Vienna Boys Choir is probably the best boys choir in the world. I will admit I am not well versed enough. That's okay, I forgive you. I forgive you. But, um, so, when I was in second grade, I ran after Adon Ravitz, as we called him, we didn't call him a Chazan Ravitz, and I asked him to test me, can I join the choir? And the way he did it, he made us, he made me sing the prayer that we say every morning, Adon Olam, Adon Olam Asher Malach, and we had to sing it in different keys, different scales. He gave you the scale and he wanted to hear if you knew how to do it, if you felt musical. Of course, I had no problem. So, okay, Yosele, they called me at that time, Yosele, you are getting into the choir. And so, at the age of about seven and a half or so, I joined the choir of the Bilu Shu. Sure. And uh, at the age of eight and a half, I conducted Friday night Shabbat. Services this is as a Kabbalah Shabbat, I assume. Kabbalat Shabbat, yeah. yeah. The welcoming of Shabbat. Eight and a half. I had a beautiful soprano voice. And so uh, when she writes about me engaged, engaged with God, yes. Uh, when I first spoke to you uh, after initially inviting you onto the show, you mentioned that you have had a long time. Uh, you've long known uh, this show's first guest, uh, Cantor Benjamin Meisner. Not only have you known him for a long time, but essentially you two grew up together 
in Tel Aviv. How, how long have you two known each other, and uh, what has your friendship been like in and outside of the Cantorate? Uh, Benny uh, sang in a choir also. He had a lovely voice. And uh, he davened also. He was uh, acted as a cantor. Can you imagine to be the cantor? Uh, for me, the age of 80, uh, eight and a half. He, and the age of 12, I became the conductor of the choir. So Benny was singing, was, he sang very beautifully, he had a lovely voice also. And uh, I think it was more an alto, but it was a lovely voice. <laughs> Mine was a soprano, a you, higher pitched you know, voice. When I first met him and uh, spoke to him about coming on to the show as well, he had mentioned that even now he is still trying to increase his range. And, and you both are in your 70s. <laughs> well, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I it's tell amazing you, he, to me that you still like... I, listen, I vocalize every day. Yes. I work on my voice. One day a week I do not do it, and that's an, on Monday. Why? Because on Shabbat I'm very busy conducting services at my synagogue here at the Fifth Avenue. Sunday either concerts or weddings or whatever. So I'm busy there. What so, and Monday I teach at Yeshiva University ah. in the evening, so if I and then Tuesday I start vocalizing all the time, and so I, it's a very healthy thing, and if not done, as the psalmist says, "Im tazveni yom yomayim ezveka." If you leave me for one day, I will leave you for two days, <laughs> and so that applies to anything including singing. And I am a pianist, I'm also a concert pianist, because equally with the synagogue, I studied the piano. You started playing at about the age of six. The age of I... six. My parents, I remember, there was no piano at home. They couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. My mother sold her ring to buy a piano into this one and a half room apartment in Tel Aviv. You know, and, and it, 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 until today, it gives me the shivers. Eventually, she got back the money, and of course, my father bought her another ring, and whatever. I studied, they, they discovered that I, when I was playing on a chair, as if I was playing the piano and singing at the same time, they figured, okay, he is a genius, he is what we call in Yiddish a wunderkind, it means a wonder child. You know, I was and going to bring up later <laughs> on that uh, I was going to ask if the word prodigy got thrown around a lot. Or it I, was. I think in Hebrew it's Pele. Yeled Pele. Yeled Pele. And so um, they took me for a test in the Conservatory of Music. Mm. And the principal said to my father, Mr. Malovani, he is so musical, give him everything. So here I am. <laughs> uh, so I, I was going to ask you, but you brought up you brought up so much of this uh, stuff about your history. No, maybe I jumped too much. Yeah. This is exactly how I was hoping the conversation would go. Sure. Uh, so with with all that in mind, uh, and all those um, all those things, uh, eventually you did serve in Sahal. As I understand it, I was a cantor of the and Israeli were, army, and, and exactly, you were a cantor in the Israeli army. Uh, as a cantor in the army, how would you say your army experience compared to that of a uh, of the typical soldier? First of all, the first two months is called uh, a training, basic training, basic training. I, until today, sometimes I wake up at night, where is my gun? after so many years. That sounds a bit traumatic. It's unbelievable. Well, it's not traumatic, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was, after that I never saw a gun. I actually, I had a gun at my disposal, but I never really needed it. Then I, I joined the chief rabbinate of the army, Rabbi, Chief Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, the famous great who parachuted with his long beard and everything, he took me into the rabbinate and I became the cantor. My job was to daven, to conduct services at various camps of the army, to teach um, chaplains how to conduct services. I couldn't be in 10 camps at, on the same Shabbat. To teach them how to conduct Seder for Pesach, to go through with them how to read the Torah properly, 
to officiate with Rabbi Goren and Rabbi Piron, who was his deputy, at weddings, unfortunately at funerals. So my day was from morning to night, busy all the time. But it was an unbelievable experience because at that time I found also somebody who taught me a little bit the voice, started to get my voice into a tenor voice in Tel Aviv, and I continued studying in the Academy of Music in Tel Aviv. So you were still actually in the Academy while doing While your serving army in the Army. I had special permission from Rabbi Goren, who was a colonel at that time. Uh, eventually he became a Lieutenant General uh, to do that. He says, but if you, duty is number one. I said, Rav, Rav Goren, is no, there is no question about it. I explained it also in the Academy where I studied composition, choral conducting, orchestral symphonic conducting, and of course a private teacher for piano. I'm a classic pianist. Right. So, so my life was right away full of music, classical and of course Jewish music. I'm going to move on. I, I like there is just so so much I would want to ask. I'll try to did be you, shorter. Did you see act? No, it, this uh, it's not. It's so much. It's okay. And I want to make sure that. Sure, I, sure. Uh, d did you see any? Uh, I, I don't like to put, to ask it this way, but I can't I can't see any other way to put please it go ahead in, in terms please of go army ahead. service. Did you see action while serving? Uh, because I, I was lucky. Time was right between. That's right. I did not experience a war. Right. Okay. When I served in the army, I did not experience war, but I did experience all kinds of military actions. Mm. I accompanied Rabbi Goren, for example, when he was crawling to get a couple of soldiers' bodies back into Israel when the Jordanian legion attacked Israel. Mm. That, I was with him, I saw that. It was very dangerous, and he was very, very strong about it. So I did experience that. Yes, all right. Uh, so uh, f following your service in the Israeli army, uh, you were a counter, in, a counter in South Africa and in England before taking on your position here sure. at the Fifth Avenue Correct. Synagogue, Correct. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the show. Uh, where does your cantorial education, uh, including under Shlomo Ravitz uh, fall into that timeline after the army because we've already spoken about uh, all of that different all of that training you were doing <coughs> during your basic training and sure. army service. I'll tell you when I got to Johannesburg one of the reasons I came to Johannesburg just for the high holidays huh. and it turned into four and a half years at which time I met my wife our older son Zevi was born but one of the reasons why I wanted to go to South Africa was South Africa was a very cantorial country. Mm. Every synagogue had a canto and a choir. And there were some fantastic cantors who came from Europe to South Africa. A cantor by the name of Shlomo Mandel, Israel Alter. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's Benny's ben uncle. uncle. Sure. And uh, so I knew that I'm going to bother them. I'm going to bother them and try and get as much as I can. So I said to myself, what can I offer them? Money? They, they don't want the money, and I don't think I could have the money to pay them. Okay. But what I offered them was, I said, give me your pieces, and I will write you piano accompaniments. At that time, there was no computer, right. and you couldn't put it into a computer. Today, it looks so beautiful. I wrote to almost every chazan, either cantorial pieces and their piano arrangements, or if they heard a recording from a cantor in the United States, especially, who sang with a choir and they liked the composition, I sat down and I wrote the choral piece, and right away all the cantors in Johannesburg and in Cape Town, mainly these two big centers, got the music. So I paid with my knowledge of writing music. But I learned from these two great chazonim, Moshe Stern, 
for example, fantastic cantor, he lives today in Yerushalayim, retired. A lot from him. His Nusach is superb. Uh, <clears throat> uh, oh. ah. So uh, you performed as a soloist around the world and uh, quite a few times with the Israeli Philharmonic. Sure. Uh, the, uh, a piece that garnered a significant amount of attention was a tenor, uh, was you as a tenor in Noam Sheriff's Mechaye uh, Hemetim, He Who Revives the Dead. Uh, you performed that piece across Europe and Israel and were the soloist in Amer for its American premiere in Philadelphia in 1998. And later that year, you performed again with the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra at Yad Vashem. Sure. Uh, you've performed for Queens, Israeli Prime Ministers, Presidents of the United States. So looking back on your career, uh, what have you gained from your performances outside of shuls and services? What I gained, first of all, was a name. I became very, very well known throughout the world. Number one. Number two, I gained a lot of experience in singing with full symphony orchestras and with very well-known conductors. I mean, I'm probably the only cantor who sang with Zubin Mehta. Who was well, that was, that was at that performance in 1998. Of course, in many places we did it with Zubin. Mm. Uh, in Philadelphia also. To, and to sing with such a great... Uh, a conductor was a great privilege, but I experienced a lot of things because these great conductors feel the singer. They breathe with the singer, and they like to understand what is going on. So I gained a lot of experience in that way. Secondly, because of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue, we have a lot of guests from all over the world. When heads of states of Israel come to New York, this is their uh, spiritual home, whether it's the president, the prime minister. I was very close to Menachem Begin, the prime minister. Close with Bibi. Yitzhak Rabin, I was very close with him. Even he said to me that he liked cantorial music. But what I did was especially when the Soviet Union began to open up. My experience, most of my concerts brought together Jews and non-Jews, hence my knighthood by the president of Poland. I'm looking forward to uh, speaking more with you okay, about that we'll a little talk. bit later, yeah. But I gained an uh, opportunity to meet heads of states from all over the world. And very often they came to the concerts, and very often I had time the following day to spend some time with them, including Mr. Putin. Him I met in Auschwitz. What an odd place to meet him. Yeah. It was the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, and all heads of states of Europe, kings, queens, princes, prime ministers, presidents were there. And uh, I chatted with him. I asked the president of Poland to introduce me to him, which he did. And we went to the side and we chatted about some important things that I still cannot reveal. And um, I'm writing now a book. I, do, I don't think I'll be able to reveal it in the book unless I get special permission to do that. I, I uh, don't but, even know if I'm... Uh, uh, this probably is not the program to get into politics anyway. Oh, no, no, so. of course. <laughs> but, but even I met him. That was the only time I met him. It was wonderful. I, I started English talking to him, but then I remember that he was KGB in East Germany. So I speak German. Ah. So I moved into German. Then he felt very good. Then we really chatted. It was before the ceremony started. This sounds so surreal. Can you imagine in no. Auschwitz no. No, on, the 27th, exactly the on the 27th of January 2005? This is the International uh, 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 Holocaust. Holocaust Memorial Day, Memorial. yeah. Holocaust Remembrance Day. So these were the experiences that I gained <laughs> as a result of that. So with all that in mind, who is uh, the most unique character or personality 
uh, to have been in uh, uh, to have been in the audience at your performances, a performance. Danny Kay. Danny Kay. Have you heard of Danny Kay? I should know that name. And oh, I the famous actor comedian Danny Kay. His name was really Kaminsky. The older people will remember Danny Kay. <laughs> no, but Danny Kay came to Bilu on a Friday night ah. when I was a kid. Um, I loved Menachem Begin mm. and I loved Yitzhak Rabin. Two sincere, honest people, different in their views, against each other politically. I didn't get involved with politics. I got involved. What do you know about cantorial music? Do you like it or not? <laughs> if you like it, I'm with you. If you don't like it, too bad. What can you do? <laughs> Uh, you, so I, I want to take a bit of a different turn here. You sure. developed a bit of a reputation, and uh, I noticed this especially uh, before the show when we were chatting. Uh, a bit of a reputation uh, for turning down non-liturgical musical roles, uh, with writers regularly quoting, quoting your words, God gave me the gift of a voice, and I will use that voice to serve Him. That's even on your Facebook page. Uh, but just because one does not perform secular music does not mean that one specifically refrains from listening to it. So I'm wondering what kind of non-religious music genres do you listen to, if any? And uh, who are some of your favorite artists or performers? I uh, listen to classical music a lot, uh, beginning from 17th century music until today, contemporary music. I listen to opera a lot. We go to the opera, to the Metropolitan Opera, or wherever we are in somewhere and there is a good opera house, we are there. So that I love. I was offered to go to the opera world. Yes, that's that's what I'm referring yeah, to, said, especially and, here. And I said, I just cannot do it. I'm a religious Jew. I will not sing Friday night. Some people who were traditionalist were sometimes stuck and they had to sing even on Yom Kippur. Mm. I don't want to be faced with such a situation. I could get even today, when if I would study the full role of Tosca, or La Bohème by Puccini, or uh, some of Verdi's opera. And if once I will learn, I would sing it, and I promise you it will be good. And let me tell you quickly something very interesting. Leonard Bernstein was a member of the Fifth Avenue Synagogue. He came only on Yom Kippur. And Leonard Bernstein heard me once at his apartment at an event for UJA. And, and he said to me that when I hear, and I sang an aria, and he said, when I hear you sing the aria, there is absolutely no trace to the fact that you are a cantor, which means that I understand style. Right. There is a, and I can handle both without any problem because of there's my no musicianship. Transition. What you're saying is there's no transition for No you. transition. I can do them both without any, in, in, within one minute. But I was not willing to go to the world of opera. But what I did do, and what I still do, is occasionally sing oratorios, on, but not Christian ones. Only oratorios that are biblical. Handel wrote a lot of biblical oratorios. Uh, Haydn wrote the creation. It's beautiful. There is no non-Jewish content, content there. That is not a problem. That I love singing and is beautiful. In a 2010 interview with the Jewish Standard, you said that it made, and possibly still even makes, you very upset when a layperson leads services. You actually compared uh, the relaxing of rules, as you put it at the time, to the book of Judges where it says, in those days there was no king in Israel and every man did as he pleased. In fact, uh, that was some of the lighter things you said in that particular interview about lay people le leading services. Uh, this leaves me wondering a couple of things. Firstly, do you still have the same concerns that led you uh, to that stance? And secondly, setting aside affiliation for a moment, 
if an untrained congregant in a shul were to step up to lead services, but did so with the intention and concentration that was required and a solid understanding of Nusach HaTfilah, uh, why should that still be a non-starter for you? Look, uh, you mentioned the word Nusach HaTfilah. Every prayer has a musical motif by which one has to chant that particular prayer. And that's called that Nusach. Dis this was something we discussed uh, okay. in the first episode with Benny. Yeah. Of course. And that is extremely important. This is a tradition that goes back hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. Some of those Nuschaot of the, of, of, of the is, is called Misinai, as if it came from the Sinai, because it's very old. Now, I have nothing against a lay person who goes to the Amud and becomes the the messenger of the congregation, or the lay cantor, or whatever you want to call him, if he does the Nusach properly. I cannot stand, and I find it a, a disgrace when they come up, these guys, and they just sing any kinds of melody which has no relevance to the prayer itself. I am a teacher. One of the, of the duties of a cantor is to interpret the prayer according to the Nusach and to make it relevant. There are not too many people, lay people, who are able to do that. And yes, you quoted what I said about the end of the book of, of, of Joshua in the beginning of the book of Judges. That is correct. There is no king, everybody does what they want. Today it has become, now what, it is becoming impossible. What right does a person who does not know the Nusach, who does not care about the Nusach, what right does he have to break the tradition? Would he break the tradition of learning the Talmud? To learn Chumash? Would he break the tradition of reading the Torah? You have all the teamim, you have all the tropes, you have the cantillation, and you, we, everybody adheres to that. Why, when it comes to prayer, everybody, as we say in Yiddish, he makes Shabbos for zich. He makes Shabbos to himself. What? He takes Friday and he makes it Shabbos. I mean, I, it's an, an extreme example. Well, uh, from what and I'm that, getting from you is that you, you, do, you don't just see it from a personal perspective of this is extremely important. You're saying, not only do I, do I see it as extremely important, Judaism and as a whole sees it as extremely absolutely important. Absolutely so. Absolutely. Let me it, tell you... To you it's like reading the Torah. Absolutely. There is a, a lot of similarities, musically speaking, between the, the cantillation, the way we read the Torah, and the nusach, the, the melodies that the prayers. A lot of similarity. One gets from the other. And so, what is it that the guys get up and they sing those melodies, have no meaning? Have they tried to, have, to visualize what that prayer is all about? Why is the Nusach that way? This is what I teach my students at Yeshiva University, and I'm now rector of the Institute of Liturgical Jewish traditional music in Leipzig, in Germany, and Berlin, together with the Hildesheimer Yeshiva in Berlin. I have the small school now in Moscow. So I, I, I try, now they want me to come to Israel to do it, but I, I just cannot do everything. I mean, there is can't a limit. Can't be everywhere at once, just That's like right. you can't lead exactly. services everywhere Exactly, once. exactly. So, but the Nusach is very, very important. And I have nothing against a layman who does it. Let me tell you a quick story. Please. I had close relationship with the Satmar Rebbe, the old Satmar Rebbe, Rebbe Eilish Teitelbaum. Okay. Why? Because he came from Siget, Romania, where Eli Wiesel, who was a member in my shul here, came. And my mother came from there. As a young man, he studied with my grandfather, whom I am named after, two years, as we call it, they studied the Torah, 
Chumash, Gemore, and everything for two years. Then he became the Satmar Rebbe. So I once sat with him here, and he said to me, in Yid we spoke Yiddish, and he said to me, Rabbi Yosef, because he remembered his friend, says, what is going to be with Nusach? So I said to him, Rebbe, what is the problem? So he said, we have a problem with our the young people. They, they don't make an effort to learn the proper Nusach as Avoteino Akdoshim, as he says, our holy forefathers davened for generations and generations. So what is going to be? So I smiled. So he says to me, why are you smiling? Mm -hmm. I said, Rebbe, I am what they call modern orthodox, whatever that means. I have news for you. There is a huge similarity between modern orthodoxy and Satmar Hasidim. He says, what, what? I said, our modern orthodox also don't know what Nusach is all about. So he burst out laughing. And then we got into it. Then I sang for him Untanet Tokif. And he, he became white because he told me that he sings it also on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Because mm. it came from Siget, from the town where my mother came from. My father was from Poland. So that's the issue. So I didn't plan to ask this, but now that we've gotten to this point of this sure, conversation, sure. I, do, I am curious uh, if, if this is where we are in the world of even orthodoxy, modern orthodoxy, uh, where I think I would put it that the younger people, people like my, uh, in, in my age bracket and younger, don't have, I suppose, a connection, and they're not, they're not personally connecting to the, uh, I'd, I'd say, maybe no longer contemporary music uh, that, that is in the cantorial world. How, how, how do we go about making it that, uh, so making I, something that look, speaks I, to them? I, I go all over, besides the concerts, I go all over lecturing mm. and, and showing it to people. And I want to tell you something. We get today requests at Yeshiva University, at the Bell School of Jewish Music, from shuls that have never had uh, chazonim saying whether it's the rabbi or the president or the gabai, said, we've had enough with all these nonsense. Can you send us somebody who can do it even simple, mm. not in a cantorial way, but simple so the chevre should hear in shul what goes on. And I, I can see a beginning of, of a return at least to the nusach. It's going to take a long time and maybe choose me another generation. But I see a beginning, and therefore I, I, I run around lecturing, teaching, being interviewed, talking about it, preaching about it, trying to make people aware that there is something called Nusach, and let's, let's do the way. Don't I want to see my grandfather somehow? I would, wouldn't I want to sing for him so that he should hear how I sing that feels like he sang it in singing. Everybody would like to see a, a forefather. So why, when it comes to prayer, to the synagogue, why that is the one that, that is so broken? Because a lot of people don't care. And they're not aware of it. So we are working and working and working. We have a lot of students at Yeshiva University and they come to learn, then they go out. I have some students, when they come back to me and they said, somebody asked me whether I study with Kento Malovan. So I said to them, how do you know? They hear because, you know, people travel, they come to the shul, I, I travel, I go to another shul. So that's the situation. Mm. Okay, well, uh, it is now time. <laughs> It is now time to uh, open things up to you, the viewers. If you have a burning question or maybe a thought that you want to share with Kantor Malavani, start typing it in now while I wait for you to send them in.
let me tell you about another of this week's sponsors. This week's episode of Live with the Cantors is brought to you by the Jewish Music Toronto Collection. You've heard about it before. With t-shirts, hoodies, bags, and more, a purchase from the Jewish Music Toronto Collection is a great way to show your love for Jewish music. And just, become, and just like becoming a JMT Patreon patron, it is a fantastic opportunity for you to directly support the channel. Click in the description below to get your own high-quality JMT apparel and more. Alright, we're going to wait a little bit for some responses to come in. May I say something? Oh, yes, absolutely. May I say something? Yes, absolutely. You know, I'm looking at your shirt <laughs> yes. and it hits me. J.M. is Joseph Malovani, yeah. and T. is tenor. Joseph Malovani, tenor. I think I should so to, get so something today, like this. So today, J.M.T. doesn't just mean Jewish music Toronto, it also means Joseph Malovani. But, I want, but you know, I want to congratulate you. Oh. I tell you why. And I, I, I'm not a schmoozer. I, I really am not. Okay. I, I'm serious. You are interviewing people in Jewish music world yeah. and you've done a couple of cantos that is very important and I'm so glad that you asked that you approached me and 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 I, I I really feel so honored I feel good that I'm able to talk about it and I thank you really for for inviting me to join you it, it, I'm ready to talk to you the whole night here <laughs> Well, uh, we, we at may least actually, until Mincha, <laughs> we may actually go a little bit over time this week, which we have not had the opportunity to do before. But it is a great conversation, and I definitely have some more questions for you. By uh, all if, means, if whether or not people take the time to send something in, sometimes you know uh, the thing with the live thing is you never know who's going to be watching live. Of course, and uh, sometimes people just don't have the time to watch it live. They'll get it in their subscription box later, and then suddenly they'll be like, "Oh, I missed this week's episode. I'll watch it now." Fine. Sure. So remember, if you want to watch and actually watch it live, you should subscribe, and that way uh, you'll get a notification when the show is coming up. Just a thought. But anyway, uh, we're going to move on. Uh, if anybody does have a question, I can check in a little bit later. Uh, I want to take a turn to your education. Uh, your biography makes a particularly strong point of mentioning your dedication to world Jewry. You've actually mentioned it quite a bit during this conversation as it is. While that particular section actually discusses your participation in major Holocaust commemorations and performances like the one we discussed earlier, Noam Sheriff's Mechaye Hameitim, uh, one might argue that your real dedication comes through in your work as an educator. Uh, as I noted in my introduction, and again, we've spoken about it before, uh, you hold the position of Distinguished Professor of Liturgical Music at Yeshiva University's Philip and Sarah Bell's School of Music. You also helped found and are the Dean of the Joint Distribution Committee's Moscow Academy of Jewish Music, uh, calling that work the highlight of your career in a previous interview. Uh, and you've lectured extensively, again, mentioned that, you've conducted workshops for students and lay people alike. Of course. So, uh, what drives your passion for musical and specifically liturgical education? What drives me so much is that I want people to understand that when they are praying in the synagogue, the notion or, or the concept if you want to call it, but I don't like to theorize it so much. Kavanah, concentration, would come as a result of two things. One of them, as you mentioned, education. Because I'm an educator, I, I explain the prayer through the music, but at the same time also, I am so imbued, so involved in the prayer, that nothing else exists for me in the world. I put all my neshama, my soul, all my voice, all my being into the concept of prayer. Because in the final analysis, we are commanded to pray shacharit. We commanded on Shabbat to pray Musaf, Kabbalat Shabbat. I want people, and I try, to come out of the services with a spiritual uplift. And 
that does not mean that we don't have melodies where I get the whole congregation to sing with me. I am a great believer in that. But I like it to be the melody to be based on the motives of the Nusach, and that is not a problem. And so in my shul, it's a combination uh, of Nusach, occasionally, of course, a little bit of a cantorial exposition and congregational singing. Synagogues which have choirs all the time, that only adds to it, to create that Stimmung, as we call it in Yiddish, to create that atmosphere of awe in the prayer. And so uh, it's not that I'm waiting for people to give me a shakoach. Oh, it was a wonderful service. You were in great voice. Well, what does it mean? Yeah, I was in great voice. So I took a higher note. Okay, so I took a higher note. It's, it's what, what I expressed. What did, what did I do with that prayer? And that is my mission. It's a mission of my life. Mm. I could, as I told you before, I could have gone to the opera and finished. Sure. No. When I saw the difficulties, I said, I am going to, to, to have my life dedicated to prayer and to use my musical knowledge that I've acquired into this, mm. to bring it to a high standard. Uh, f from where do you draw the most joy? when teaching or working in an education-related role? Where do I draw my... The most joy. The most joy. I love teaching. And I enjoy very much when my student sing, students sing the piece that I taught them. And when I teach them any of the tefillah, of the prayer, step by step, they get music notes with music notes with the text in Hebrew transliterated and when they start singing for me and when they come to take a test at the end of the semester in the middle of the semester and I said I often said to them okay I'm not going to ask you sing this or that I may do it later you tell me what do you want to sing mm from what I taught. So if that can be a particular challenge for them because very also, much so. it, it's an awful Believe me, very <laughs> much so. <laughs> but it gives me tremendous joy when they stand up and they sing this Unsane Tokev. We are now before Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Yom Kippur. When they sing it the way I teach them. And that will make a tremendous impact. And vocally, it's not texting, not texting. Vocally, it's not a challenge. They can do it soft, they can do it beautifully, but I want them to do it. When I hear them sing what we call Malchuyot, you know, on Rosh Hashanah, we crown God as the king. Mm -hmm. Zichronot, when we remember God, and we ask him to remember us. And Shofarot, they, they, when they got the Torah at Mount Sinai, with the Shofar and everything, and there are a lot of verses from the Bible, from the Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. And when I hear them singing it for me, the proper way, the nice way, I'm the happiest man. And if a rabbi or a president calls me up, and I know, them, I know many of them all over, <laughs> and when they call me up and he says, you know, we had one of your students daven for us, Rosh Hashanah, it was wonderful. It, it did it so nicely. It was not fireworks, but it was something beautiful. It was good. It was meaningful. And when I get that, that gives me a lot of joy. Mm. Because, and then another joy is when, when I teach and they, they make comments. And perhaps they even offer something that they would like to do. Is it okay or not okay? And in, mo in most cases, it's okay. That gives me a lot of pleasure, a lot of joy. So I love my students. I give them my heart, really. I, 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 it's not the 45, 15 minutes that I teach. 
I, I end up being another hour, an hour and a half there, beyond the call of duty. But I'm happy to do it because I, I, I see results. That's joyful. Hmm. Do you feel that you've, uh, not that you're done or anything like that, but do you feel that you are leaving a, a lasting legacy for generations to come? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. Because of the music that I teach them, the philot that I teach them, how to chant them. Uh, for example, I sit with them on a, on a given prayer and I sing it simple. Then I show them how I would do it with some improvisation. Because improvisation in cantorial music has a very important part. Mm. But not everybody is able to improvise, and that's fine. It's not a problem. But, but when I give them all the various possibilities of doing it, that's legacy. They sit with their machines and they record what I sing for them. So what else do I want? Can you describe uh, the initial vision for the Moscow Academy for Jewish Music and what you think it has done for the world of Jewish music since its inception? I wouldn't say so much for the world of Jewish music. Oh, okay. What I would say is that when I started in 1988, and when I uh, prepared everything for a year, and then I was, the first visit to Moscow was in 89. Um, you were asking again, remind About me? About the, uh, the academy and uh, yes. what? <laughs> and I tell you, guy, first of all, guys came from all over the former Soviet Union. Okay. Well, it's, at that time, it was still Soviet Union. But I heard voices. Russians sing beautifully, and they are very musical. By the way, in Germany, most of my students are Russian Jews who live in Germany. So they learn, and then they went back to their communities. And then they called the, uh, the heads of those communities, I did not know at that time, but they called the chief rabbi of Moscow, uh, whether it's Rabbi Goldschmidt or Rabbi Shayevich, the chief rabbi of, of Russia, and... and uh, and for that matter, even the Chabad chief rabbi, uh, Beryl Lazar. And they said, the man came and he sang for us. They, we never heard a thing. Of course they never heard, because they were not exposed to it. They didn't so, have the opportunities. The, of course, them. absolutely. And when they come and said, you know, these last high holidays were unusual, unusually beautiful. Right. And it gave us a lot. We sang with him, we listened to him. So that was, the idea was not to the world of Jewish music. It was to the world of Jewish music in the former Soviet Union. And that to me was very important because I, to, to experience the awakening of this lion called Soviet Jewry and to be part of it, by doing the tefillot, the prayers, and the nusach, and the melodies, and everything, and, and bringing them back to Yiddishkeit, this is tremendous. And believe me, I used to sit with them from morning to night, for two weeks, singing. And, the, and the con first of all, I came, I did the concerts, got over the concerts, got written up in Pravda. And then, the following morning, we sat down to learn. And we learned, and we learned, and we learned. That was, but you talk about Soviet Union. Let me tell you a quick anecdote, Please. if I may. Yes, absolutely. So my wife and I went to Israel. When one of the, I mean, we go there often, a couple of years ago. Okay. And we got to the, to the, to the passport control. And, the, you know, there is a policeman or a policewoman sitting there in that, what we call boot camp. Customs officer. In a, well, it's not a customs, it's really this, uh, only to stamp oh, yeah. their passport. Okay, yeah. To stamp the book. And I stand there with my wife, and I see the girl sit there, young girl, in her 20s. And she does this, and she does that. And she does this, <laughs> and she does that. 
I said to my wife, something is going on. Mm. Either I'm crazy or she's crazy. Or I you're suspicious. Know. Or I'm suspicious <laughs> or something. So she says to me in Hebrew, Adoni, sir, Atam Daber Ivrit, do you speak Hebrew? I said, of course. Well, you see, I've been giving you my Israeli yeah. passport as I'm coming <laughs> back home. Then she says to me, Tagidli, tell me, Atashar, do you sing? <laughs> so I said to her, this also. My wife was getting nervous. Yeah. <laughs> then she said to me, are you by any chance a chazan? So I said, that too. I said, what is it all about? She says, I'm getting out of the thing and I want to shake your hand. So I said, what is it? So she came out, yeah. we shook hands, my wife, myself. I said, what is it all about? She said, let me tell you something. You came about 10 years ago at that time or more, maybe 12 years ago, whatever, to Vilna, Vilnius, which is the capital yeah. of Lithuania. And you premiered a, by a, a, the Lorette composer of the Lithuanian government, a Jew called Anatoly, Anatoly Cerberus. And then you sang Hebrew and cantorial music with the Philharmonic Orchestra of Vilnius. So that's true. My I, at that time, she says I was 16 years old. My parents took me to that concert. Do you know what that happened when they came home? My parents said, that's it. We are signing up, we are going on Aliyah to Israel. That music hit them. Anatoly Senderovas, his name is, ah. the, the, the composer. Okay. And then my own repertoire with the orchestra. Can you imagine the liturgical, because it was liturgical music, right. even the oratoria, it's called Shema Israel. Yes. What else do you want? It was on text of the Gaon of Vilna. The, uh, and she says, that made my parents decide, I was a teenager, to go to Israel. Hey, the good news so is then I said to her, thank you. Yeah, more than that, <laughs> then I said to her, tell me something, are you letting me into the Israel or not? <laughs> She's tempted and we got in. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I, I want to take a bit of a lighter turn before we end the show and look at uh, what you've brought sure. to share with our audience today. But I do have one more thing to ask you before we get sure. to those questions. Sure. In a 2011 interview with the Orthodox Union's Jewish Action magazine, you said that you feel inadequate uh, in your role as Shalich Tzibor, literally translated as public emissary. Uh, and appropriately so, I would say, uh, given that the prayers call for the chazan, for the high holidays, uh, to be a very specific way. Uh, so what would happen, hypothetically, if suddenly one year you felt that you were absolutely, unequivocally the man for the job? It's a tough, it's a tough question. I said it was going to be before the light It's questions. a tough question. <laughs> the question is, from what point of view of being inadequate? Ah. Would it be because I did something wrong? Would it be that the voice is not serving me properly, God forbid? Thank God it's as beautiful as ever. Would it be because, God forbid, I'm not well? and I am not in the condition of doing it, that would upset me very much. That would upset me very much, and I would do everything in my power and in the power of the doctors, and the main doctor, the Almighty, for me to pray for him, to him very much quickly, and to see all the doctors so that they should make me well enough to do the high holidays. You know, we say the prayer of Hineni. That's a prayer for the cantor 
before yes. we start. That's uh, that's uh, that's specifically what you mean. The discussion yeah. that was being asked, of course, which is why I want to, uh, which is why of I course. was wondering if, of course. if somehow you know you 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 had the different position on it. In any anime mass, I am a poor man with nothing. Basically, it's a reminder to you that you should never even think of the uh, the. Opposite. I should not think about the time performing. And there are three attributes that the cantor has to have, according to that prayer. Mm. And that's only for the cantor. The congregation sits and listens. And I put in a couple of melodies where they see, even sing with me. Although it belongs to me, but that's okay. Number one, to have a beard. Number two, to have a beautiful voice. Number three, to be adequate as a human being, as a Jew, as an honest person. And when I stand and pray on the high holidays, these attributes are on my mind non-stop. Zaken veragil. Zaken means an old man. Ragil, somebody who has been doing it for a long time. But, you know, the rabbis say in the Talmud, miu zaken, who is an old man? The one who shekana chokhma, who acquired learning and, 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 and cleverness, or whatever you want to call it. This is in my mind during the high holiday, during the whole year, but specifically high holidays. And my prayer is always that I would like the people to be with me as I proceed with the prayers. And as I would like to be a better person, I would like the my congregants to be better persons. And I see it sometimes. Sometimes they go back to their old uh, behavior, but all in all, I know that when they pray, they pray with, with feelings and with honesty. Otherwise, they wouldn't come to the synagogue. Mm. Why should they come? They come. The synagogue is packed. Year after year. This year will be my 46th Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Slichot, the Saturday penitential Saturday night. I have a choir of Hasidim from Borough Park, from Mansi, a beautiful group of eight guys with the Streimlach, with the Bekeshes, with everything, and they sing compositions. It's beautiful. I say Slichot, two hours because I pay attention to everything. I cry to the Rebona Shalom. There is a Slicha says, Ech niftach pe. How on earth can I open my mouth in front of you, O oh God? Mm. And that's really what I mean. All right, so we've taken that. Let's get a little bit lighter. I realize that this has been brought up in previous interviews, but I do have to know, how do you manage to have enough stamina, not only to still be standing by the end of services on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but actually to still have a voice by the end of all of that? Well, first of all, I studied voice. I had outstanding voice teachers who taught me how to maintain the voice, how to, to keep it properly, how to have a technique for that. That is important. And I must tell you, when it comes to Ne'ila, the end of Yom Kippur, I feel fresher than before, when everybody else is falling, they are tired and I everything. Noticed, uh, I noticed in one interview you mentioned that uh, you have a two-hour sit-down, basically, or whatever yeah, the amount during of time Mincha, between During Mincha, I, I relax, I sit on my seat, I don't go out. I am in the shul from the morning till the night. I don't go out. Because my people, they are the ones who send me as their messenger. They are praying in Mincha. Uh, what right do I have to sit in the office and relax there? No way. So I love what I do. 
I am so concentrating that there is nothing that disturbs. It's, it, it's okay. Mm. Uh, what is the most captivate, uh, captivating piece of music that you've performed, uh, not critically, but uh, personally, to you? What is the most captivating piece? You mean cantorially? Any piece. Cantor, uh, well, whichever, the look, most. <laughs> cantorial, uh, I love, as I spoke before, about Unusane Tokev. Yes. That prayer is something no other religion has that. And I, I, I uh, suggest to your listeners to, your, to look at the Machzor and, and look at the English translation. It's not a problem. It's, it's a heavy piece. Very heavy piece. I love doing it. I also, from the classical point of view, I enjoyed extremely singing the creation by Haydn mm. and Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the Ode to Joy. Okay. That is a very, very famous piece. And uh, I know it in Hebrew also. Because I was assistant, at the age of 16, I was assistant conductor of the Tel Aviv Philharmonic Choir. And so um, I, 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 I learned all these things. And I could, Ronu gil zener eloha, shir mizmor likrat chedva, bilvavot shchurei shalhevet, nit yatsev al saf nava. He's just talking about the beauty of, of, of joy and brotherhood. You know, my slichot services is, to me is the most important. Kol Nidre night, of course. Because the slichot service, the people who come to my synagogue, and it's packed from Hasidim with Traimlach, modern orthodox, conservative, reform, reconstructionist. Everybody comes to my shul for slichot. In other words, something touches them. We call it in Yiddish the pintele yid, the, the, the Jew of the... The, 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 the speck. The the speck. Uh, <laughs> something right. touches them, something takes them back. They want something. So unity is very important. I myself am an Orthodox man, 100% Orthodox cousin, only in an Orthodox shul. That's okay. But I never ask who comes to my services. Everybody is welcome. According to your biography, you've been awarded the Joseph Malovani Chair for Advanced Studies in Liturgical Music. What do you think at Yeshiva University? At Yeshiva University, what do you think about having been awarded a position that literally has your name written on it? I, they gave me a little <laughs> chair when there was a big dinner, and they, they had in some kind of a little box, they gave me a little chair, and I have it at home. There is like <laughs> one day my grandchildren will, will, if they want it. It's nice. It's very very nice. It's it's not the that thing. It's the idea that Yeshiva University sees in the whole idea of the liturgical Jewish music something very important. And, and the fact that they've created the chair, it's the same thing. I mean, I teach and it's all very nice. Finally, before moving on to what I believe is uh, on your lapel there, uh, while researching for today's show, I learned that you had a credited acting role uh, not actually all, uh, pretty recently in the Netflix original movie The Week Of <laughs> starring, starring Adam Sandler and Chris Rock uh, fittingly you played very a good. character very good. and you still managed to uh, stick to your reputation for liturgical work only how on earth did that role come about and uh, what was the experience like for you? so um, Adam partnered on this production yeah. with, a, with a member of my congregation. Ah. And uh, that member of my congregation, Robert Smigel, 
Robert Smigel is a member here at the Fifth Avenue sure, Center. Oh. Sure, sure. <laughs> and his parents are members, and his sister and uh, husband and family are members. So Robert Smigel called my son, Dr. Alice Malovani. Okay. And he said to him, you know, we have this thing, uh, that movie with, 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 uh, 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 with uh, Adam, yeah. Adam. And, and Chris Rock and uh, a number and, of others. Rachel and, uh, Trash was in We it. need a cantor there. Yeah. Do you think your father would would agree to do it? <laughs> so he says, "Why don't you call my father?" But no, he says, "No, you talk to to your father." Yeah. So, so my son called. Okay. And he says, "Dad, you know Adam Sandler needs you for a movie." I said, who is Adam Sandler? <laughs> I didn't know. What do right, I know okay. about this thing? And the other one, Chris, Chris Rock. Rock. Yeah. Well, I don't know who he is. Sure, okay. What do they want? They need you to sing something. What do they want me to sing? I don't know. And so it turns so out said, it was oh, Kelmale, right? It was a memorial service yeah. for somebody, and there is that other actor who sits there and cries and cries and cries. And I hear that that movie is making an unbelievable impact. People are watching it like crazy. Really? And uh, so that's how it came I, about. I actually watched a bit. I just, like, I, I first of all, <coughs> found the scene, and I watched the scene, and it's, it's, it comes across as a bit absurd, which I suppose is the entire movie. I don't know if you've watched it yet. I did. Yourself. Uh, so now knowing what the, the, the lead-up to that scene is, what was... <laughs> Well, Look, uh, I don't know, when we sat in that synagogue somewhere in Long Island, I don't even remember where, right. I must have recorded it at least a dozen times. Sure. This one, you have to stand here with the cantorial clothes. Yes, they and had, you, they had yeah. full, full guard My, What they call it, the, the canonicals. In England, they call it canonicals. And um, so I sang it, but I was careful. I didn't say the word of God. I said, Kel yes, yes. To be careful, because after all, it's a movie and it's not... A There's no s significance to it. No. Yeah. And, and so I sang it, and they, they used, I don't know, about 15, 20 seconds of the whole thing. Yes. After singing a whole day. <laughs> but it's okay. It's, it's, it was very, very nice. It was a nice experience. <laughs> And uh, after that, uh, the, we had a showing in one of the movies on the west side, on Broadway, and then we, we went to a reception, and the reception was kosher. Well, there you go. The reception was kosher, only because of me. Oh, that's lovely. So, that's, what that's it, so, what have I, so what have I achieved here? I achieved something that here is a movie, most of the people, Jews or non-Jews, what do they know? Those people, they don't know much about kosher. But it was kosher. This is a tribute to, to Adam Sandler, to Robert, Robert Smigel. Smigel. Yeah. Sure. That's lovely. Uh, before we wrap up for today, you've brought something special for sharing with our guests and our audience today. Uh, so let me ask you, what have you got there? What, uh, what did you bring to show us today? What did I bring to show you? I believe it's... Uh, well, that I wear all the time. Yes. This is the knighthood from the Polish president. Not the present president. Yes. Two presidents ago. Well. Alexander Kwasniewski. He recognized, he okay. recognized that I brought people together for an understanding. Okay. And there was a beautiful ceremony I think you can see it on YouTube. I'll and, try to uh, find that for you later. And uh, and uh, this is what I was... I was given lots of medallions, but I'm not going to walk around with my big medallions. But this is that you see a lot of French people, for example. People who got from the... This is exactly the French Légion d'honneur. So that's what I have. And, uh, so I, I always have it on my jacket. If I don't wear a jacket, I don't wear it. So on the jacket, I wear it. Just I think it's a special bit. honor. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. All right. That is all the time we have for Live with the Cantors this week. In fact, we just got a rap call, so that is <laughs> perfect timing. Cantor Malavani, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank it's you been so an much. Absolute pleasure. And thank you for inviting me.
Uh, I want to give a big thanks to my Patreon patrons and all of this week's sponsors. This show would not be possible without you. Remember to check out the sponsors down in the description below. Thank you to 81 Entertainment for their technical assistance with this show. This year, 81 Entertainment is celebrating 10 years of making your commercial and branded productions everything they should be. Learn more at 81entertainment.ca. Tune in next week for uh, tune in next week on our regular schedule, Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. And uh, subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss a thing. Remember to join me on Patreon to take part in spreading knowledge of Jewish music and to get more out of your JMT experience. Contributing a buck or more each month gives you early and exclusive access to behind the scenes extras and more. So, Thanks for watching, and bye for now. Uh-oh. What happened? I don't know if that was working. Hold on. We might have an issue there, but you are... Okay, Sheila, we oh. are done. Yes. We are, uh, we are still streaming. What is it? The class is at 7.30 in here. <laughs> yeah, well, we...